if you go back even before I could say short, he planted the official thing. Um, in the last supper, Robin was there. We had something called um, Black Ball, right? And then Trinidad Boogie. We were using Dolak and that same kind of rhythm, you know, in 72 and stuff like that. So just to show you, there was movement from us who just came out of school. There was movement from Clive Bradley, who knew no boundaries whatsoever. There was movement from the Bootmans. Because remember, the Bootmans had Rockefellers, right? Mm-hmm. And, and they were starting to experiment outside the box also, too. Ed Watson, who was on the next end of the island, used to listen to a lot of Venezuelan stations because where he was in Carinash. So he had that influence of, of Spanish music, you know. So it was all coming together, nice gel building up slowly but surely. All right? Um, you know, and but that is how it, it moved out. I want you to do something for me. For the people who the kind of non-music people and stuff define what makes something soca as opposed to normal um regular traditional calypso and like regular four four type um american type music that be popular music what's the difference what makes something soca all right nothing makes anything anything um it is everything is what it is basically or it, I mean, part of that movement was into soca. Well, the change at the time it wasn't called soca. Part of the movement for the change was um, when it was strictly calypso at carnival time. Sure, you have your your tent, your social commentary and stuff, but then you have your up tempo calypso, right? Um, and that rhythm was the bass drum was to 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 to, and was almost like kick and hi hat almost, and the snare. Drummers did different things. It depends on the drummers, but basically the root of that used to be with the tempo calypso. Were doop, 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 doop. Right, uh, and 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 the the bass line used to follow was like a chord symbol. It used to follow the um, it would actually, it would actually, actually follow we, the, we the thing. Call, we used to call, they used to call it the walking bass. Right, right. Um, mm -hmm. That is why calypso in those days was considered to be jazz. In a, in a global market, was considered to be jazz because of the kind of bass it had, you know. So that doop 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 doop. Um, so you could go and find stuff like Kitchen and Sparrow and all that stuff and melody. You find the bass line used to be doom 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 doom, like a walking bass. In jazz. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, yeah. What Pelham call it chord symbols. All right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, the change from that was because as a performer in that era. The big kicks for us as musicians was to watch foreigners come in a carnival and couldn't dance to the music because they couldn't find the one. They couldn't find the backbeat. Right. Because when you have to, 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 um, remember the old thing about the tourists can't whine? Mm -hmm. It's because they couldn't find the one and they couldn't find the backbeat, the two and the four. And that's what happened basically. And right. Then, so our music is I, one and three? Or? Huh? What, like Calypso was what? One and One and three? No, it was was was, was uh, what they call cut time, March time. Cut time, yeah. Right. One, yeah, two, explain cut two, time. One, two, yeah. Right? Um, so the idea was to change up to, I guess, to make it more worldly and accommodating. Mm -hmm. And once that bass drum changed to four on the floor, it opened right. up a new world. You know, from the time that bass drum changed from dup dup to dup 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 dup, that opened a whole new world. So oh. what was what was la 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 t t t what 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 was it um, soca that was, or, um, um, or pop that was that was s o c a because I think that was one of the first songs of the Sound of the Caribbean because that's a song that Robin had wrote and actually I was in simp and I had to sneak into cage to play keyboards on it because remember I was working in a computer studio oh, okay. <laughs> so I had to sneak in after hours to play keyboards on that. Um, um, it was who was the, I think engineer um, or oh, producer was um, Ron Saint Germain, right? Um, oh gosh! And then I think this guy had a hand in it too, um, Mariah Carey's ex-husband um, at Sony. Um, who does Michael call the devil? Uh huh. Wait, mm. um, but um, it wasn't um, it wasn't Casablanca Records. That it was, was Casablanca. On? Yeah, it was Casablanca Records, 
right? right. Uh, I think uh -huh. Ron injured me with that. But this other guy had a hand with it too. Um, because remember, those, those guys went... At the, I know the, the guy they, you're talking they, about, man. Um, huh? But yeah, but that he used all the great session horn players and stuff in New York on, on that. Right. Yeah, but you know who sang background vocals on that? Um, no. The background vocals in La La Titi is Donna Summers. Donna yeah, Summer. yeah, so I heard, so I heard, yeah. so I heard. Some, wow. Yeah. Um, so, um, am I frozen there? Yeah, you're frozen, but don't worry. We go, we go, right. we go unfreeze here just now. All right, no problem. Um, so, yeah, so things were happening with that. And around the same time, not long afterwards, um, there was an album done in Semp in 1976 for Carnival 77. Now, I was known as the new kid on the block as a synthesizer specialist more so, right? Um, so a lot of things, I mean, all I played keyboards. Um, they were better pianists than me, you know? Um, but, uh, for instance, when you listen to Maeve and Dave recordings, all them strings and said, that's me, right? A lot of the synth strings and stuff in that ear was me. Um, that Carnival album, 76 into 77, Sparrow's Boogie Beat 77, um, was produced, uh, arranged by Alvin Belfast. And Belfast was one of the forward-thinking ones ahead of me and wanted me to do synthesizer. So at the time, I had limited synthesizers. We only had two in the studio, a synth machine and a, a, a mini Moog or micro Moog. Um, and I rented every synthesizer from Hari Mahabia, the Indian Orchestra, right? Um, and I lined it up there. When it was time for me to put my parts, Sparrow decided um, Calypso music don't need that. It's like, I can't be Calypso, so you're not putting it on, you know. But out of that album, if you remember, there was a song called Carnival Woman. Mm -hmm. Carnival Woman, right? We had a deal with um, CBS Sony at the time, CBS. And we were um, releasing stuff for them down here, and they were looking at stuff that we were doing. They took Sparrow's Carnival Woman and did the first 12-inch disco remix, right? And that was a big thrust. I mean, it wasn't really taken on much here, but it made an impact in the, the minds of a lot of people in North America, in the club scene where Calypso was starting to move into that space, you know. Right. We just, we just never followed up on it here. I'm glad we reached there, because there's the important, the whole, whole crux of this whole program is, all right, so you're saying we were, in fact, exposed to all the big international record companies at the time, right? Um, so why we didn't make that jump? Why didn't we go to number one on the billboard charts then like why do we why we never crossed over per se like no, you know I mean, in terms of like sales and 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 getting airplay on foreign radio stations and stuff i mean all right that is a million dollar question through the last 20 30 years again i've been asked that um, i mean when i look back at the experiences i i have seen around me and plus mine my thing is coming from that era to then we we lost track of how diverse we are. Um, and we almost kind of keep, we keep pigeonholing ourselves into this is our culture and this is our culture and this is our culture. Um, we are what we are. Um, we're not only Afro, we're not only Indo, we're, we're so many different things. We are funk, we are pop, we are this, we are that. And that era, we were producing so much music of such diversification. It was unbelievable. Um, like, for instance, I, remember, I can't remember who the artist was. There was, um, I remember I produced uh, a piece of funk music, a seven inch for a guy. And um, was very much like, um, very much like Earth, Wind and Fire and stuff. The guy was a decent vocalist, but the track was a bad track. It got some airplay on radio. And I remember CBS had wrote back and said they wanted the track, but they did not want the vocalist, right? Um, because the track, they thought the track was very, you know, was banging, but they had it, they earmarked for another artist. The guy who did the original thing, uh, the writer and the artist at Sim, he refused to let it go. Because he, he told CBS, unless he's the artist, he's not really letting the song go. 
Hmm. So things like that have held us back. Um, and then you have things like, all right, at the time, what you considered Calypso or what you considered Soka, um, if a foreigner comes and tells you they want to do you, do something with you, you're almost, a lot of times, the mistake a lot of people made was trying to dictate to the foreign market um, what they should do. In other words, the, the artist wanted to produce the producers, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I can understand I am creative and I hold firm to this. Cool. There are some people who will hold firm to that. But if you're going commercial, you have to delve into what you're doing to, to facilitate certain regions, certain pockets on the planet, right? Um, give you an example, like in Jamaica with Bob Marley, you know, Bob Marley, you know, um, the reggae from the scan stuff before, right? Um, from the blues, uh, blues busters and guys like that, and the Johnny Too Bad. Um, when Island Records came into Bob, they record their stuff and they send it to London to finish. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're not wrong at all. They did. Right. In so fact, we, the, in fact, Richard was, Richard Bailey played on a lot of those. Early Bob Marley, Bob Marley records. Um, Richard told me he played. He was sixteen years old and he played. He played. Um, he said he played drums on the original "Stir It Up." Richard Bailey um, at sixteen years old. Yeah, but the thing is, at the end of it, I think from understand is that's where roots rock really came from. The rock, the roots was in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. and the rock was done in London. So you yeah. understand what happened? Yeah. So if if that did not happen, this. It would have been nice, culturally nice. Jamaica would have their music. But that experience would not have happened and unleashed Bob Marley to the world, you know. And my thing is, that is, we were starting to do that. But all of a sudden, it started to get clamped down, that people became so very culture conscious, that they're not doing this and they're not doing that because that's not the culture. It's selling out this and selling out that. Hello. Yeah, but Bob and they never, in a way, never really sold out. I mean, Bob never tried to sing like a Yankee, right? No, no, or, or, no, or, um, no, no. Exactly. you know, but no, exactly. the thing is, is that they, but what they were doing was so powerful for themselves that people had, you know, and I think that about our music too. I think we just try too hard to make things for the foreign market. And, you know, we had a whole guy build a big, big, big studio and everything was was the billboard charts and do, 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 and all kind of thing. And it never happened because, you know, I think we should have just, I think we should just make good music for ourselves and it is going to, 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 to jump. You know, but I don't know. No, all right. You see that statement you just made there? Yeah. Nothing wrong with that statement except the word just, right? Um, because we were making music for ourselves, but we are not that big a market. So if we can make music for ourselves and be happy, cool. Mm -hmm. But you cannot make music for yourselves. And if you have a limited market and expect to earn the kind of money... All right, but, but how to. come, like, in Seattle, some little band start some kind of little alternative thing and just that little area in Seattle they play in that and then all of a sudden it catch on somewhere else and catch on somewhere else and next thing is a big worldwide phenomenon you know because I mean Penny Lane is a little street in um in, in Liverpool but the whole world know where is Penny Lane now you know yes but you see the problem is again if you're on the continent in North America there's a market share a huge market. If you're in Europe, it's a whole thing, right? Um, do you know the, the biggest market in the world for music right now? Tell me. Germany? Asian market, India. Wow. <clears throat> and you see, let's look at the numbers. So there are two sides of it. Um, you're dealing with your, your true and your cultural self. Again, like an artist, be true to yourself. But then again, you know there are spaces where you have people who are artistic and then there are people who are commercially artistic. The problem is we try to we are trying to pigeonhole ourselves into one space only. You know, like we should only have this, we should only be like this. Um, there are artists who who will not move from playing the Afro drum and singing night, um, playing acoustic guitar, some playing kind of poppy rock. 
whatever it is, be, be yourself. But anytime you step out of that true artistic space and you become commercial, you have to let the rest of the world interact with yourself and you interact with them, you know, because that is the market you're going after. Um, uh, you, you can't expect to go... Um, going after or should they come to you? Should they hear it, like it, and come to you? Both ways. It should be... Again, in this business, I keep saying there are no rules. The only rule in, in this industry is there are no rules. You know, um, you don't go hunting down and running down labels. Sure, yeah, you have people to deal with that. But at the end of the day, there is a space of one side of be true to yourself as a creative person and the other side of Am I going to get a hit? Am I going to make a million dollars? How many people in the world are going to like my music? Full stop. You know, it's, it's a balance inside there. You could be anywhere inside there. You don't have to be one of the next. You could be one today, another one tomorrow. You All know? Right. And oh, mm -hmm. that's it. That, that's the problem I used to have before where somebody who is truly artistic, then you want to do something with them, um, which is more commercial. And they get excited. They really like it. And they'll hold back that, like, Viva can't do this, boy. My partner's going to tell me I sell out. You know what I mean? You know, well, so decide where yeah. you want to be. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm glad we reached there now, right? Now, I still want to... Um, okay, Mario always believes that we would have gotten a lot further if we, what he calls, remix the music. Um, now, remixing... Um, you have two types of remixing. You have remixing where you take the original tracks and you go back in the studio and you remix those tracks. And then you have the remixing, like what a, a DJ or producer will do who will take like probably just the vocal track or some of the drums and add stuff to it, right? Um, so, Mario, what remix... How, when you say we should, we should have remixed the music, explain to Beaver and see if we could find out what it is we're really talking about. Yes. And he's right. He's perfectly right. <laughs> yeah, well, you remix the music to suit the particular market that you're after. You know, and um, I felt that the road that we went down currently, um, which was the more reggae, hip-hop type of style, you know, if we had remixed it for more dance, we maybe would have been able to penetrate that European market. So that's how I feel with, with the remixing. Um, but on a point of, you had some very, coming back to the Firefly days, because, uh, you know, it it stands out in my mind, and certain tunes, mm -hmm. I, I look at it as very exceptional, it will go down in time. Um, you sang the song Fool in Love. Mm -hmm. Was it an original piece, or was it, um, it songs foreign? It was, it was an original piece. It's um, yeah. basically was Francis, Sky and Myself. Mm -hmm. Um and why did I, I basically had gives basically given Frank um, Francis a framework to, to start, and Francis finished the song basically. Um, but that was the song I used to launch the band. Mm -hmm. That song was recorded at Criteria Studios in Miami, and for those who didn't know, Criteria was the shit at the time in Southern US. Um, that's where the Bee Gees recorded. Um, when we reached there to record, who was recording in the next room to us was John Mellencamp. Um, so, I mean, the huge names were recording there, right? Um, and, for instance, uh, I was just going to use it to launch. Um, went up also to buy equipment for the band. So Woody was there, drums, bass, guitar, keyboards. So Woody, JR, um, Francis, and myself, and John Afford. Five of us went up to Miami to buy equipment and to record, right? But it does have a, a sort of, um, the recording this seemed different, eh? Huh? The recording, it seems, right, it, it seems no. different. <clears throat> no, because, all right, first of all, the engineer we used <laughs> was the engineer for the Eagles, that's number one, hmm. right? That was Grammy-winning Eagles engineer, the guy who recorded Hotel California, all that madness. And... Um, who I work with to assist me with the arrangements. The strings you hear there, that is the live string section that the Bee Gees used to use. Wow. Right? Um, the horns that played there, um, that was the guy who arranged it for me and did the solo. He also used to arrange um, and produce horn arrangements for Gladys Knight and the Pips. 
hmm. right? Um, so the sound of it, again. So that's what I mean by it's song. That's that's what I mean, Mario, by it's song foreign. Eh? Yeah, yeah, it have a, a, a something a foreign touch to it. You know, it it. it so foreign. So did you ever get any label interested? I just want to in that song. Foreign, foreign means foreign means good. No, 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 no. The recording. When we listen to the recording, mm. the recording has a, a foreign feel to it. And don't that, have to be yeah, good. And, you know, you could tell a difference in in the recording. All right, but, but I know we have a thing we they say every t- people has come used to come by me and say, boy, when people hear my music, they they say it's song foreign boy. So foreign became. No, but he's, I, I used he's, to, he's I used, telling me I himself to, that it's that's how it was recorded, well, and I'm just from from okay, hearing right. it, I could tell. So, uh, so foreign. I didn't know the history so, of it. For so foreign is good. <laughs> Let me understand. Foreign? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. It, it's um, it was never say foreign is good because I was never on, under that thing. Um, mm-hmm. It depends. It, 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 something is either good or not good. Right. Because that's we had world class drummers and musicians down here. We never had a proper string section. Right? Um, so the fact that I use live strings, was you realize it was not off of here. Because people always just say that it sounds different, Beaver. It's the live strings that made a difference. That is quote unquote the foreign song. Because we never had that here. And mm-hmm. we still don't have it. Right? Oh. Um, the attitude of how the horns were played also is different to how local horn players would have played the horns. Um, um, see, again... So it's a fusion then, as we're saying, basically. No, it was no fusion. It was a pop song. It was, no fu- right. it was a pop song. It was a straight-up pop song. Mm-hmm. It was no fusion. It was a straight-up, straight-up, straight-up pop song. There was no cross this and pop song. And the thing is, I have been doing. I've been doing that. All right. So okay. So why? So all right. So why that didn't cross over, Percy? It huh? was a straight pop song and thing, and and you recorded by where the Bee Gees recording. So everything was in your is in your favor. So why then? Why don't you think that song became a, a Billboard Hot Hundred? Uh, maybe song? because I'm marketing. And that time. is what. Uh, that is what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, all right. I'm, not, I'm not gonna be very honest here. No, it's not about only marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, look at the production. Um, Francis and myself are not the best vocalists in the world, right? Um, that was done really to launch the thing. At the end of the day, maybe if I if I had two major vocalists in the world sing the song. Yes, maybe. Um, but it, this, it had limitations to it. I mean, I've been very real, you know. Um, I was no um, Stevie Wonder singing. Um, Francis was no John Lennon, you know. We did what we had to do. We did our best and we put forward. And it was there for a purpose, you know. Um, but coming back to the remix thing, um, if you study the success of Madonna, right? And if people remember a guy called Jelly Bean. Yeah, he used to produce right? Mad- remix yes. from Madonna. <clears throat> yeah, when, when like Madonna, that era, when Madonna released a track, within two to three weeks, there's the uptown mix, there's the uptown Italian mix, there's the cross tongue. Puerto Rican mix. There's a downtown funk mix. In other words, they remix for different markets, just exactly like Mario said. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and that is what we never did. And that, that was coming back to what I'm telling you, that um, we ca- we still today keep pigeonholing our stuff here, you know? And if it don't, if it's for carnival, and it has to be there, and you can't change it from, from you have to spread your love, man. You have to spread your love. And unless you do that, you're not going to get hit. So what has happened in the process over the last 30 or so years is people from outside have come and experienced what we experience and extract from what we like and what they vibe off. And they do exactly what Mario's talking about. In other words, they remix the, the identities of our music. All right. Okay. What are trying to ascertain... Mm-hmm. The hindrance to the music, was it more, as you suggested there, the production or the marketing of it? Like we spoke to David Rudder. David Rudder said he thinks the music 
was okay and things like that. But the record companies and stuff made mistakes and basically it was a marketing thing, right? And you are saying it's like more we pigeonhole ourselves so it's a production thing. Um, it's both. It's both. Um, ex explain. For instance, the remixing thing is a marketing thing, right? Um, if if I sing la 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 la, la 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 la, and behind that la 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 la, I have a calypso rhythm, doop, doop, da, da, la la la, I could remix it to soca rhythm, I could re remix it to dub and bass, right? Um, dubstep, drum and bass, I could remix EDM, reggae. That is part of marketing. In other words, you decide how you want to shape your product for different markets, right? So it's part and parcel, production and marketing. But a lot of a lot of the artists and producers who are just afraid to step outside their comfort zone, I should say. And even though if you if you know you don't step outside your comfort zone, you should allow other people to work with you within a marketing environment to take your music. Um, it is it is somewhat difficult to. No, I wouldn't say, I would say it's impossible. And anybody in the business will tell you this. You cannot predict a hit. You can't just sit down and decide, I'm going to do something, I'm going to create a hit, and it's going to go to number one. Unless your checkbook is reading, you know what I mean, that you could spend, you could buy your way to the top. Right? Well, um, we had people who thought they could have buy their way in, and that didn't work. So uh, No, but you see, buying your way comes with attitude also. Checkbook alone doesn't get you in. Attitude has to work alongside with it. Mm -hmm.